or two weeks ago, I guess, we talked about hepatitis C treatment in general and the workup of patients who have a diagnosis of hepatitis C. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit more about like special considerations with patients who have a diagnosis of hepatitis C. So I have no disclosures. And today I will do identify potential drug interactions with hepatitis C medications, discuss importance of treating HIV and hepatitis C co-infected individuals, identify hepatitis C treatment options for special populations. So first I want to start with drug-drug interactions with hepatitis C. And before I go on, I just want to say, you know, this is not a complete list of all the interactions that are out there. And you should always perform a drug interaction check. I just wanted to talk about some of the more common ones that we see and how they might affect your treatment option choices. So I kind of broke it down by class. And so drug interactions that are common to the NS5B inhibitor, which is sofosbuvir, which is found in the brand name Sovaldi, Carvoni, Afclusa, and Bosevi. Um, one of the big ones is anticonvulsants, and so they're contraindicated with uh, sofosbuvir, except for um, Keppra. So um, carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, phenobarbital, and phenytoin are all contraindicated. So if a patient is on any of those, it makes it difficult to have a selection for actually any of the uh, medications. And so you might have to send them back to a neurologist to kind of see what are some options for treating seizures. Um, one of the other big ones is St. John's wort. So when you're talking to patients, you know, just when you're getting that medication list from them, be sure to include questions about over-the-counter medications because I think a lot of the times they may not consider it a medication because it's a vitamin or something like that. And so an herbal supplement, St. John's wort, is one that is also contraindicated and I specifically ask about it with patients. And then some of the HIV medications um, have interactions as well. And I'm gonna to touch on those a little bit more in detail as we get to that section. Um, one thing that also pops up is amiodarone. And so there can be a serious symptomatic bradycardia with sofosbuvir combined with amiodarone. If we're looking at the NS5A inhibitors, the, part, the ones that are part of ledipasphere and valpatosphere, so Harvoni, Epclusa, and Vosevi. Um, the Joxin will need more frequent monitoring when they're given together. And then Rosuvastatin, which is Crestor, um, has an interaction. And so the, these um, hepatitis C medications can increase the concentrations of Rosuvastatin. And so there's a maximum dose of 10 milligrams a day when you're giving that with Epclusa. Um, also, there are other uh, statin interactions, so I would always double check those as well. Um, they're not contraindicated necessarily, but there might be dose limitations and or more frequent monitoring for the side effects because of those increased concentrations of the statins. If we're talking about just Vosevi, which is the soft bell box, um, there's a little bit higher drug interaction potential with this medication <clears throat> because it has the NS5A, it has the NS5B, and it has the protease inhibitor component like we talked about last week. So there are more medications that are not recommended, so methotrexate and sulfasalazine being ones I've seen more commonly. A big one that we see a lot are patients who are on acid suppressing agents, so especially proton pump inhibitors, and I feel like there's a large portion of patients who take omeprazole every day and have for quite a while. And so while it's not a direct contraindication, it's not recommended to take a proton pump inhibitor with valpatosphere and ledipasphere because those medications both need our stomach acid to be absorbed um, in the best way possible. So they were studied and they were approved with doses of 20 milligrams daily of omeprazole or less. And if that's the case, then with um, Harvoni, which is sofosbuvir and ledipasphere, the recommendation is to administer the omeprazole at the same time as the medication on an empty stomach. And then when they studied it with Epclusa and Vosevi, the recommendation is to take those with food four hours before taking the omeprazole. So I just wanted to put that in there. Now, like I said, it's not contraindicated. However, if it's possible to discontinue the acid suppressing therapy if you can, then go for it. Because I think a lot of the times patients get started on these and maybe they were supposed to do a 14-day course or um, they just continued or they got continued on it when they got out of the hospital. So I think this is a good time to stop and have a conversation with the patients about the need for their PPI. 
And so if you, um, if they're on a higher dose especially, then I would consider tapering it down to the lowest dose that you can. So like 50% per week for a while and then kind of every other day to minimize that rebound hypersecretion from the acid. Um, antacids, the recommendation. So this is like Tong, Rolaids, separate it by four hours. And then for the H2 blockers, famotidine, ranitidine, the recommendation for Harvoni, <clears throat> Vosavi, and Alclusa is to administer them at the same time or 12, 12 hours apart from the hepatitis C medication. So the recommendation here is not to exceed doses of 40 milligrams of famotidine equivalents twice a day. So like I said, none of these are contraindicated. They do have dose limits, but if you can get the patient to discontinue those agents, then their chances of cure might be a little higher. Now, Zephyr is another one that we talked about last week. So I'm just hitting on the main, most commonly used ones. And so there's, I listed some here. I'm not gonna go through each of them in detail, but there aren't any interactions with those acid reducers that we talked about in the last slide. And then glucaprovir pyrentosphere, which is Navret, is the other big one that we've talked about. And so again, it's gonna have some of those same or, or interactions like with digoxin. It also has an interaction with dabigatran. One of the big ones that we see come up is that it's contraindicated to co-administer with ethanol estradiol containing products. So these are birth control products that have ethanol estradiol in them, not just estrogen replacement therapy. So don't get that confused. Um, so it's not recommended to give Navra at the same time as patients who are on ethanol estradiol containing products. So either a progesterone only birth control or selection of a different hepatitis C medication if that's the way that you decide to go. Again, it's gonna have some of those same contraindications with the seizure medications and St. John's wort because of that CYP3A interaction. And then we'll talk a little bit about the HIV medications again. Um, this one doesn't have the same interaction with omeprazole, and so it can be co-administered with 20 milligrams of omeprazole and can be used with up to 40 milligram equivalent of omeprazole. So when it was studied that way, they said to give it one hour before, so the omeprazole one hour before the Mavret. It's kind of confusing because they're all studied a little differently and the recommendations of administration is different. Um, now, however, statins, again, there's interactions there and um, it is contraindicated for use with atorvastatin. Okay, so that was just kind of a quick overview of drug interactions, again, always do a drug interaction check. And at the end of this, I put the um, website I like to use. It's the hepatitis C drug interaction check through the University of Liverpool. And they have a HIV one as well. And they're both super fantastic and they keep up to date and have great explanations on why the interaction exists and what you might do if you encounter that interaction. So I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about hepatitis C and HIV co-infection. So about five to 10% of patients who have chronic hepatitis C are also co-infected with HIV. And on the flip side, if you look at it, about 25% of patients with HIV are co-infected with hepatitis C. And they estimate about 75% of patients who have HIV and inject drugs are also co-infected with hepatitis C. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of overlap between these two viral infections. So compared to patients who have a uh, mono-infection with hepatitis C, co-infected HIV and hepatitis C patients have more than triple the risk for liver-related morbidity and mortality. And that's pretty substantial. And so I think that's why we need to really focus on making sure to get treatment for these patients. Not only that, there's an increased risk for non-hepatic organ dysfunction and overall mortality in this patient population. And as you can see with this slide, it kind of shows um, the progression with patients who are co-infected co with HIV and hepatitis C in the blue, and you can see that line goes up for the percent with cirrhosis, and it goes up much more than the purple line, which are patients who are HIV negative. So HIV is an independently associated risk factor for advanced liver fibrosis and cirrhosis in patients who have that co-infection. So for hepatitis C treatment, if we're talking about treatment in um, co-infected patients, the efficacy of treatment and the adverse events 
are similar to those that were seen in the hepatitis C mono-infected patient population. Treatment does require continued awareness and attention to drug interactions, especially because there are more interaction potential with the HIV medications. And so we'll talk about each of those and I'll give you some references for how to look through those. Um, but this shows that the treatment recommendations, like so for genotype one, this was a study where they looked at cure rates, which is the SVR we talked about last week. And you can see that this first section here is the HIV hepatitis C co-infected. The rates are 94 to 97% from the study, which is very similar to the mono-infected rates, cure rates of 95 to 100%. So really, really good cure rates still, regardless of if they have hepatitis C and HIV co-infection. So when we're looking at this, you know, when you have both hepatitis C and HIV treatments are indicated, you want to make sure to select appropriate regimens. So if both are diagnosed at the same time, then you want to make sure to pick the initial HIV regimen that will work well with hepatitis C treatment. If the patient already has a diagnosis of HIV and is on treatment for that, then you know, we can pick a hepatitis C medication that will not interact with the HIV regimen. And if that's not possible, then sometimes you, know, you might have to switch around the HIV regimen so that um, a medication can be selected that will treat the hepatitis C with lower rates of um, interactions. So it's not recommended to stop HIV treatment to allow for the hepatitis C therapy, like I mentioned. You might wanna do a switch with the antiretroviral treatment regimen so that you can do both. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these and specific interactions with HIV regimens. <clears throat> so I started with Zepatir here, and I've listed here a lot of the ones it can be used with, and then there's a list of the ones that it should not be used with. I'm not going to name each of them, but you can look back at this um, with a re as your reference. Maverett, again, here's the list of medications that can be used with and list of ones that should not be used with. And there's limited data on the safety of using Maverett with Elvitegravir and Cobacistat. And so you might, the monitoring then for hep hepatic toxicity is recommended to be a little um, more careful with that. Eplusa actually can be used with most, with most antiretrovirals, um, but shouldn't be used with this list here. So there's just a few that it can't be used with. Um, however, there is an interaction with Eplusa and the tenofovir disaproxyl, so the TDF. It might increase the concentrations of TDF. And so in general, you know, you're gonna avoid this in patients who have a GFR of less than 60. And you could switch to a TAF regimen if that's possible for this patient population. Same thing really with Harvoni, they're very similar, right? They can be used with a lot of the antiretrovirals and um, the same recommendation here for the TDF toxicity potential. So in those combinations that might increase the tenofovir levels, you know, making sure to do a baseline and ongoing assessment for nephrotoxicity for these patients. This next chart, looks a little busy. Um, it's from the hepatitis C guidelines, so the AASLD IDSA guidelines that we referred to last week. They have this chart that kind of helps because you can look color coordinated and see. So this first column of colors here is the ledipasphere, so phosphovir column. So that's hard bony. You can see if it's green, then it indicates that co-administration is considered safe. If it's yellow, then there might be a dose change or some additional monitoring that's needed. And then red would indicate that the combination should be avoided. And then it goes on to have a couple of other things. So you can see the letter A, and on the right here, I put that key for you to look at. But caution only with tenofovir disaproxyl or um, on the increased levels, avoid, and it tells you what those things stand for. So it's a nice way to like quickly glance and see uh, if you can see those um, interactions and what, like I like tables because then you can see a lot of information at once. So, okay, well, I know my patient is on this medication and what else might be green with it? And then kind of go from there to look a little further into those medication choices. The next table is hard to read on here because I couldn't um, increase the font, but this is a similar table from the NIH website. And so from the AIDS info guidelines. And 
Um, it has little check marks if you can use it. And so on the website, if you go to that link I included at the bottom, you'll be able to see this a little better. I just wanted to show you the difference between the two different um, guideline websites and how you might use them to select medications. Okay, so other special treatment considerations for patients with hepatitis C. Um, so we talked about drug interactions, and so like I said, always do a drug interaction check. Here's that website, hep-druginteractions.org is a great one to use. Um, patients who have hepatic impairment are another special consideration. So child P, B, or C patients. You're going to avoid the medications that have the protease inhibitor when patients have decompensated cirrhosis. So you can't use the Zepatir, the Mavaret, or the Vosevi in that patient population. And sometimes, depending on the patient's um, information, then you may end up having to extend treatment for patients who have decompensated cirrhosis, or there are some recommendations to add ribavirin. However, I don't believe ribavirin is available right now. At least I couldn't get it for a patient we needed it for in the last few months. So it may not be an option right now for those patients. Another special treatment consideration would be hepatitis B reactivation. And I feel like I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because it can be like this, this whole other didactic just about hepatitis B reactivation in the patient population. But if someone has a history of hepatitis B and you treat the hepatitis C, then there's the potential for the hepatitis B to reactivate. And so that's something you would monitor for during treatment. And we monitor by getting LFTs every month while they're on treatment. And if we see an increase in that, then we'll go on to get a hepatitis B viral load and check it out a little further. Um, you know, so I would recommend avoiding Harvoni, Epclusa, and Vosevi if patients are on proton pump inhibitors, especially if they're greater than 20 milligrams. But even if they're 20 milligrams, if we can go a different route, I typically go that way. Or if we can get them from omeprazole down to ranitidine and maybe just once a day, kind of increase their chances for um, treatment success. Uh, genotype 1A is another special treatment consideration. So if you want to use Zepatir for this patient, then you would need resistance testing. And it's like four or $500 for that test. So um, just something to think about there. Also genotype 1 patients who have a viral load less than 6 million, you can potentially use Harvoni for eight weeks in this patient population. However, you cannot use it for eight weeks if the patient has an HIV infection, if they have cirrhosis, if they're treatment experienced or black. So in, that, in any of those patient populations, you're gonna still need to go with the 12 week course of Harvoni. So just as a little, um, summary here, you know, always do a drug interaction check before starting hepatitis C treatment, whether your patient is on HIV medications or not with any medications. Get a really good over-the-counter medication reconciliation with them so you know exactly what they're taking. Um, the treatment outcomes for hepatitis C are similar whether the patient is mono-infected or co-infected with HIV. And it's not recommended to stop HIV treatment to start hepatitis C treatment. So we'll have to like work together to come up with a treatment reg recommendation or regimen that will be good for both. On this last slide, I included some resources. So I use the hepatitis C guidelines here, um, the NIH website for some of the HIV AIDS guidelines. And then um, if you're not familiar with it, the University of Washington has some great um, modules for hepatitis C and HIV. It's online curriculum, it's at your own pace. You read through slides, you can listen to people talk about slides, you take a quiz at the end, and they have really great information updated about the different studies and clinical calculators. You can get free CME for it, I believe, um, but I recommend it for both of the topics if you want a little refresher in them. And then I looked at some of the package inserts as well for these medications. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing, and then if you have any questions at this time, I'll take them.